Hey man. Want some chips? Um, sure. Jeremy, what are you doing? What's that? I said, what are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm cutting my carbs. With an abacus? Yeah, man. You got some better way to do it? Yeah. Watch the next session. Yeah? Well, um, can I keep my abacus, though? If you want. Weirdo. Hi, everyone. My name is Adriana Valencia. I am a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. Today, we're going to be talking about carb counting, how to count carbs in the real world. Today's talk is more geared towards patients with type 1, and it's going to be kind of taking a little bit of a deeper dive into carb counting today. So first, I want you to think, what are some of your favorite things to do with your family and friends? I bet some of you are thinking movies, going to the beach, um, going to a party. I bet a lot of these things that we enjoy doing with family and friends revolve around food. So many times when we're traveling or when we're eating at someone's house or when we're at a restaurant, we tend to eat a lot of different foods than we do when we're at home. Now, it can get really difficult to estimate the carbohydrates when we're eating out or eating at a party, as I had mentioned, or eating at someone else's home. So what we're gonna do today is discuss some strategies to help you estimate the carbohydrates when eating something that's a little bit different. And we're also gonna talk about kind of accounting for uh, fat and protein as well. So I want you to start thinking a little bit of why is carb counting so hard? Well, you're not alone in the thinking. Even dietitians have a hard time cal carb counting. There was a study that was conducted in May of 2018 that found that as the meal size gets larger, the margin of error for carb counting gets larger as well. So basically that means that the bigger the meal, like potatoes or pasta, the harder it can be to carb count. Um, especially for things like I mentioned, the rice, pasta, chips, or polenta. So I'm sure you all agree with that and already knew that before I even mentioned that to you. So I've always kind of felt that there's three layers to carb counting. The first step is really being able to identify what foods contain carbohydrates. The second step is being able to identify the serving size of those foods. Okay, for example, a bagel has about 55 grams of carb. And the third step of that is accounting for fat and protein content of the meal. Now today we're gonna to focus on number two and number three. We're not gonna do the identification of carbs um, just to kind of save some time. If you're new to carb counting, you may still be working on number one and that's okay. So go ahead and there's a lot of other videos on the TCOID website that you can review um, for some kind of starting off carb counting tips. Now um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some applications you can use on your phones, on your smartphones. There are many different applications out there that can help you with carb counting. Of course, you are welcome to use whatever you feel works best for you. These are the two that I'll be touching on today with you. One of them is Figui and the other one is Calorie King. These are the little widgets that you'll find in your app store when you're searching for them. The first one we're gonna talk about today is Calorie King. So it's a free application. You can also access it on your computer. So if you're on your desktop or laptop and you type in Google Calorie King, it will come up. The reason I like this particular app um, is because it has a really large database that it uses. Also, there's no need to create a login, so you don't need to put your email and your name and your goals. That's also what I like about it. Um, it does have a free version, just so you know when you're using the free version on your phone, or on your computer, there are a fair amount of pop-ups. It's fine, but I just wanted to make that you aware of that. You can get rid of those if you do uh, a paid version of that as well. Now to show you how Calorie King works, you can type in a food such as the one that you see here in the example is watermelon. And what it does is it pulls up on the side when you type watermelon, it will show you an average. So it has watermelon raw there. You can see it also pulled up a slushy from Sonics. So if you're just gonna have regular watermelon, you can click on that. And when you click on the food, 
it then gives you the nutrition label for that particular food. Now, the nice thing is you can also modify the serving size. So a lot of them you can do tablespoons or cups. So um, on this one, I think it's just for one cup of watermelon. And you can see you can also change to two cups and it would change the nutrition label. So this is really nice because it gives you a nutrition label for something that you might not have or might not know. So if you're eating something like couscous and you don't really eat that, you can look up the carbs for couscous on here, for example, or the calories. You can also look up fast food. It has a very large um, kind of database for fast food. So it has things like Starbucks and Panda Express and Little Caesars Pizza. So it can really help you keep on track for your carbohydrate goal or help you with carb counting when you're eating out as well. The second application that I'm gonna touch on today is called Figwe. As I mentioned, this is the little widget for it when you look in the app store. This is also a free application. This one you do need to register, you need to put an email in and create a login. So this one you put like your name and you have to put your email and you have to log into it um, initially. The reason why I like this app in particular is it has a visual component to it, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, this one does also have restaurants incorporated in. The, the database is not as large as something like Calorie King is, um, but like I mentioned, it does have that really nice visual aspect as well. So this is an example of what Figwe looks like. You can see that this is a plate of hash browns. So there's a, a search bar that you put in something like apple or hash browns or fruit, fruit loops, and it will show you a bowl or a plate and you can see that on one side, the serving of the hash browns is a little bit smaller compared to the one on the other side. Now, when you see, you can see that there's a small, like golden little arrow on the side of the plate. As you move that arrow along the plate, it changes the serving of the food that's on there. In this example, the potatoes, and it also modifies the nutrition label there. So it's just a really nice guide for if you're, like I mentioned, you're eating out or at someone's home, maybe you don't have, you're not, you're not eating something you're familiar with, you can help search it on here to give you a good estimation of the carb counts. So this one I really like for the visual. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of other apps. These two are the ones that I usually recommend kind of using because of the large database, the reliability, and this one for the visual component in particular. Now also, if you're eating out or at someone's house, it's important to kind of remember, well, what does one cup look like? You can say, I know one cup of pasta is 45 grams of carb, but when you're looking at your plate, you might not know what that actually looks like. So you can visualize one cup is about the same as a baseball, so about a fist size, we always say. Quarter cup is about the size of an egg, and two tablespoons is the size of a golf ball. Now this can really help you when you are not sure of the serving size of something. When you're at home and you're kind of first starting carb counting, I always recommend to patients to take out your measuring cups and not use them necessarily every time, but when you're first starting to visually assess what one cup looks like on a plate, it's very helpful so that you can start realizing like, oh yeah, this is what one cups of beans looks like or a pasta looks like on my plate or my bowl. Okay, now I have to say that we're gonna start treading into some murky waters here. A lot of the first part of the presentation is probably things that you've heard before, you're familiar with the information. Now we're kinda gonna take a step, um, a deep dive into step three of the carb counting. Okay, as I would kinda mentioned earlier. So I had to sort through a lot of information <laughs> to kind of get these recommendations. Um, the studies that I found, I will say, were more focused on patients with type 1 diabetes, okay, not type 2. And the studies that were conducted were usually with people, people who had a sensor and also have an insulin pump. Now, just because most of the studies were conducted on patients with pumps doesn't mean that this doesn't carry on to you if you use syringes or pens at home. I just wanted to let you know that when we're going through these, this information that that was primarily the group that was being looked at, was type one patients with sensors and insulin pumps. So published in um, the American Diabetes Association journal, there's something called Diabetes Care. 
Now, it's a journal that ass assists healthcare providers in staying up to date with the latest research and recommendations. In January of 2020, there was an article published in this journal that was titled, that's titled, Insulin Dosing for Fat and Protein, Is It Time? So this article reviewed some of the research that has been conducted on how fat and protein affect blood sugars. So we're gonna keep this, these next couple slides very simple, um, just for time's sake. Um, so as you know, carbohydrates go into our bloodstream and affect our blood glucose levels. We knew that one. Protein can also affect blood glucose levels as shown above. And as I mentioned, the cycle is much more complicated. I'm just trying to keep it simple for our understanding. Um, there are a lot of different hormones and cycles involved here. But to keep it simple, we're going to say proteins convert to amino acids, which then can affect our blood glucose levels. Now, fat is even more complicated than protein is. So like I said, I kept it simple. So fat gets converted to free fatty acids and glycerol which in turn can affect your blood sugar level. Now fat also affects how fast, quick, how quickly food empties from our stomach. Okay, so essentially if you're eating a meal that is higher in fat, it tends to slow, out the em slow down the emptying into your digestive system, which also slows down the effect of um, the blood glucose level effect of that particular food. We'll talk a little bit more about this as well. So you might think, okay, Adriana, what does all of this complicated information mean to me? So I did my very best, like I mentioned, to comb through the publications and the recommendations. Um, I will say that the recommendations vary from person to person, okay? The recommendations I'm gonna review with you in the next slide are just a good place to start. Make sure that before you make any changes to your regimen or the way that you cover for your meals, you always discuss this with your diabetes care team to make sure that this is something that they feel is safe for you to try. Okay, so good news, I'll say, is that there doesn't seem to be a difference in blood sugar changes based on the type of fat that you are eating. So if you're eating a meal that has a lot of basically like animal fat versus a lot of uh, peanut butter, it doesn't matter in terms of where the fat is coming from. The biggest difference is more the actual amount of fat versus the type of fat. So that's good news, makes it a little bit less complicated. So as I mentioned, like many recommendations, this depends on the person. Um, some studies found that for a high fat meal like pizza, the amount of insulin required ranged from 75 to 120% more than usual intake. Now I show you this information just to tell you, show you that it's hard to give a blanket recommendation for everybody, okay? So what we're gonna talk about, like I mentioned, is just a kind of a safe, good place to start. But as you can see, you're gonna have to see what works best for your body and how your blood sugars respond to these, to these um, adjusting for fat and protein. So a good place to start would be to calculate the amount of carbs from a meal and add about 20 to 30% more for high fat meals. And a high fat meal is defined as 40 grams of fat or more. We'll give you, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Now, if you have a pump, I mentioned these studies were done on patients with sensors and pumps primarily. If you have a pump, you can start off by using a dual or split wave, which basically splits the coverage for the meal half. They recommend starting in half Sorry, 50% now and 50% two hours later is typically a good place to start. Um, depending on the food or your body, you may adjust that to be 60-40. It just kind of depends. So as I mentioned multiple times, there's a lot of variation from person to person. This is a conservative place to start based on the recommendations that I've read. Um, and you'll start to see what works for your body. So consider for high fat meals, 40 grams of fat or more, adding 20 to 30% more for the carbohydrate count. Oh, and the other thing that I have to mention is if you're eating a very low carb meal, but it's very high in protein, such as if you're having like um, steak and salad, for example, you may notice a blood sugar spike much later. Um, the recommendations for dosing with, with higher protein meals um, aren't as 
are a little bit harder to, to kind of define. Um, so I would say, like I mentioned, starting off with this 20 to 30% is a good place to start. So let's do an example. This is a picture of a local mocha, bur mocha burger, which you might eat on vacation or at a, you know, at a restaurant. So this particular burger, well, it's not a burger, it's more like a plate, I should say, is about 60 grams of carb and 48 grams of fat. So 48 grams of fat is more than the 40 grams of fat that I had discussed earlier, which would define this as a high fat meal. Okay, there's gravy in here, right? We're not surprised. So using the conservative recommendations, instead of dosing just for 60 grams of carbohydrate, you would actually be dosing for 72 grams of carb. So what you would do is you would take the 60 grams of carb, multiply that by 20%, which would be 0 0.20, and that gives us 12. You go back and add that to the 60 plus the 12, and that's 72 grams of carb instead of the 60. The reason why you're doing this is because this is a high fat meal, and we know that because it is very high in fat, some of that fat and protein will end up getting converted into essentially carbohydrates, which will affect your blood sugar, okay? So that's why we're recommending this um, additional added on for this particular example. So you might be thinking, well, what are some other foods that are high in fat? I don't, I don't eat anything like that plate earlier. So these are some other pictures of some foods that would fall under the 40 grams of fat or more category. So this would be when you would add on extra for the fat and protein dosing. So there's an in and out double-double, right? I'm sure we've all had something like that before. Pizza, a very high fat meal, right? Because of the cheese and the meat that usually is there. Um, there's a hash brown scramble burrito from Chick-fil-A there. There's a sausage egg McMuffin McGriddle from McDonald's. And then the bottom picture shows Panda Express. There's Beijing beef, orange chicken, and fried rice. So these would all be good, um, this would all be good examples of when you would be doing a little bit of extra dosing for the protein and fat. And you can also look up the carbohydrates of these foods in your Calorie King or Figwe or whatever other application you like using. So I know that this is a lot of information that we reviewed. Um, so let's just talk about briefly kind of just keeping general healthy eating habits when we're eating out. So think about sharing an entree with somebody, um, ordering a non-starchy veggie to keep full. That would be things like a side salad, chopped up veggie, celery, sticks, anything like that. Watching the amount of chips or bread that's brought to the table or that you have. Kind of picking between having a dessert or appetizer can really also help reduce calories and carbohydrates overall. Also in your meal, if you know that you wanted to have to share a piece of cheesecake with your family and you're ordering a plate with salmon and rice and broccoli, you can say, you know, no rice, I'll just do the broccoli. You know you're going to end up eating a lot of carbohydrates and cheesecake later. So don't forget that it's okay to ask for substitutions. Also looking up the menu ahead of time is a good idea. Like I mentioned earlier, using one of those applications can really help. That way you can feel comfortable with your carb count, your carbohydrate counting for these meals. Now, these tips are really just for anybody in general for healthier eating, not necessarily for somebody who has type one, right? I would tell somebody the same thing, consider sharing an entree, order a non-starchy veggie. So these are things to just keep kind of in mind when we're eating out, because that's when there tends to be a lot more calories and, and carbohydrates in our meals overall. So to summarize, um, remember that you can always use your phone app to help you look up carbs of meals and also that you can see the fat intake in there as well if you're unsure if it falls in this high fat food category. Consider for high fat meals of 40 grams or more, adding 20 to 30% more insulin coverage for those meals because of the conversion we had talked about. Um, remember that before making any changes to your dosing or your insulin regimen, you want to make sure that you talk to your diabetes care team to make sure everybody's on board. Um, and remember to always check your blood sugars, of course, if you do make any changes to your, to your dosing habits or your pump settings. So I know this was a lot of different information today. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope that next time you go out to eat with your family or you go to a, some kind of party, you enjoy that meal and that you remember the re recommendations that we went through for the high fat dosing. Here's a list of the references that I used in case you wanted to do more of a deep dive into some of the studies that I reviewed. Thank you so much for listening today. I know it was a lot of information and I hope that you took away some helpful tips. Thank you.